Hi, and welcome to this um, Shakta Traditions lecture. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Bihani Saka, who is lecturer in Hinduism and Buddhism at the University of Winchester, associate faculty member at the Oriental Institute at the Oxford University, and research member of Common Room at Wolfson College. Bihani is currently leading the research project, the Divi Purana, the rise of the goddess in Indian history, text, culture, and female persona in ancient India. A really fascinating research project linked to the Shakta Traditions um, program. And one of the outputs will be the first full critical edition of the Devi Purana. Bihani is the author of Heroic Shaktism, and this year she will publish a book on classical Sanskrit tragedy. All exciting projects that we're looking very much forward to. And now I would like to pass on the word to you, Bihani. Thank you very much to the uh, Oxford Center for Hindu Studies for this uh, invitation. And uh, we are in um, you know, very strange and difficult times and um, hence things are, uh, we have to do things in a little unorthodox way, but it's a wonderful thing that that academic research and discussion still continues. Um, so today uh, I will be speaking about uh, shock the inscriptions and how information from inscriptions can help in uh, in uh, uh, giving us a deeper understanding of shock the traditions. So, without further ado, I I uh, ask you to to uh, see the lecture and uh, if there are any questions. Um, um, I, I would actually be very happy if there were questions. Perhaps if you could direct them to the OCHS, and I can. Uh, respond by email. So thank you very much. Thank you, Bihani. My talk is titled Proving Piety, the history of medieval Shakta devotion in the light of Indian inscriptions. In studies of religious history in early India, inscriptions have sometimes been overlooked as conveying less important information about aspects of religion that have not tended to interest uh, religious historians on the whole. Texts that convey uh, theolo theolo theological notions, philosophy, liturgical practices, uh, mythology have on the other hand received comparatively greater interest as vehicles of belief, of doctrine and of tradition. In recent years, thankfully, scholarship on Indian religions has begun to show the importance of inscriptional material, not just for a precise understanding of uh, facts, uh, uh, facts concerning dates and, and names um, uh, relating to Indian religions, but also information that we can think of as theological concerning doctrine and concepts and mythology. In, the, in, in various ways, um, in various ways, inscriptions reveal wider conceptual, theological, and political narratives. How were deities conceived and described? How did temples grow powerful? How did local deities grow powerful? Why were donors making grants? Who were the donors? What kinds of donations did they make? What rituals were performed for the recipient deities? Which were the important devotee lineages? And much, much more. Now let's examine a bit more closely why inscriptions are important for uh, historians of religion. Now the large body of inscriptional materials from early India may be seen to precisely plot piety. Now what do I mean by plotting piety? Now, plotting piety was a process undertaken in a number of ways. First, uh, a donor could plot or prove his piety by uh, his or her piety by the establishment of large sacred institutions, such as temples and monasteries. Two, by supporting the running of complex temple structures. 
Three, by the asseveration of his or her personal faith in a deity within the inscription. Four, by making gifts, including land, to deities and or to the priests and priestly lineages serving them. Five, by narratives of how the, the political power of the donor was substantiated by the deity. And six, by obeisance verses beginning the inscriptions. Now, inscriptions recording the act of giving or dana uh, must be seen in the wider context of the spiritual value of dana within uh, early Indian religious traditions, uh, both uh, within the Hindu traditions, within the Buddhist traditions, and also, of course, in the Jaina traditions. Now, according to um, statements made in the inscriptions, dana, or the act of giving, uh, was for spiritual merit, for punya, for oneself, for the giver, for the giver's parents, and for the sake of the higher spiritual attainment, which could also be liberation. And we also find statements in inscriptions that link dana to a realization of a, a, a cynical realization of life's insubstantiality and the vicissitudes of fortune. So, for example, there is a copper plate of Subhiksha Rajadeva from Yoga Badari in the Kumaon Hills. And this records the granting of rent free land to three deities, and one of the deities is a goddess, Durga Bhattarika. Subhiksha Rajadeva prefaces his, his inscription confirming his. Uh, his a magnificence uh, with the following statement that he made the this donation to augment the merit and fame of his parents and himself observing he says that the world of mankind its waves unsteady as the leaves of an ashwatha tree tossed by winds was in insubstantial in the form of a bubble and having realized that the goddess of fortune Lakshmi was as fickle as the tips of her young elephant's ears for the sake of liberation in order to escape transmigration. So Dana was related to Punya and and to, uh, uh, to the renunciatory values that underpinned uh, Brahmanism and uh, Buddhism and Jainism. But dana could also be an expedient form of asserting the power of the donor. We find in many inscriptions that acts of giving were recorded in order to uh, implicitly uh, valorize the identity and the lineage of uh, of an upcoming king or a small uh, or a small lineage that wished to assert itself on the political map so there were these two aspects that come out in inscriptions one which is the the obvious part of, um, uh, of the of proving uh, piety which is to prove one's one's altruism and one's uh, uh, one's uh, spiritual beliefs, but there was also proving one's power, which was in a w in many ways the implicit reason for recording uh, one's uh, one's uh, donations uh, to deities. Earlier studies, uh, particularly by Alexis Sanderson, have shown us. Um, that we can understand a variety of uh, developments within what he calls the early medieval process through uh, uh, an, a rigorous study of inscriptions. 
In the Shaiva age, Alexis Sanderson includes the study of inscriptions and he reveals the social developments with which Shaivism was deeply intertwined. The involvement, that is, between wider social and political forces and the Shaiva traditions led to the expansion and dominance of Shaivism. I do beg your pardon for the typo there, it should of course be dominance of Shaivism. Sanderson calls these social developments the early medieval process. And this early medieval process involved several aspects. One was the expansion of monarchy through the rise of new dynasties in the Indian political landscape. Two was the growth of temples established both by rulers and local authorities and the expansion of their powers. Three, the growth of urban centers through nodes of commercial transactions coming together and through rulers planning developments. Four, the spread of agriculture and the means of agricultural production, such as irrigation, the reclamation of land, establishing villages. And lastly, the absorption of growing populations. Sanderson argues that, and I quote, the fundamental reason for the religion's success underlying in structuring the mass of particulars now lost to view was that it greatly increased its appeal to royal patrons by extending and adapting its repertoire to contain a body of rituals and theory that legitimated, empowered or promoted key elements of the social, political and economic process that characterises the early medieval uh, period. As I had mentioned, many of the sources that led Sanderson to arrive at this conclusion were inscriptions commissioned by early medieval rulers recording their acts of piety towards Shaiva institutions and priests. Now that we've seen how fruitful uh, the study of inscriptions can be for our, our broader understanding of, of religious history, let me now turn to um, how inscriptions can enrich our understanding of Shakta history and in particular what uh, historical patterns we may be able to infer from this mass of uh, massive data. Between the 7th and the 13th century CE, many epigraphs etched on copper or stone slabs on cave temple entrances or on the basis of statuary were commissioned by subcontinental rulers and communities which formalized grants to powerful forms of the goddess and asserted devotion to them. These sources, attesting shark the piety, plot the process of, patron of the patronage of the goddess cult, the consolidation of political authority through such patronage, strategies involved in the formation of kingdoms, who the worshippers of the goddess were, modes of her worship, and the chief geographical centres of her influence. So, as I had mentioned, that not only um, do these pieces of material history offer basic information needed for the construction of any historical argument, such as dates, names and places, but they can really reveal uh, much larger conceptual and political narratives. They can allow us to wield together a uh, a step-by-step -step narrative of how uh, deities um, expanded their their centers of influence, um, and how uh, and how uh, ideas connected to the de to to these deities um, changed. Inscriptions to the goddess may be found on various uh, substrates. Uh, inscriptions were carved on copper plate or stone slabs. Usually, if the donor is a royal uh, donor, then the inscription would be carved on a copper plate, uh, and th this uh, these inscriptions would record 
uh, the donation of land, say, to a temple or land, say, to Brahm Brahmins attached to the veneration of the, of the deity. Um, uh, they, they, could, they also appear at the base of sculpture, uh, recording the donor's name who had commissioned that work of art, as well as on cave temples, on doorways or on the walls. I have here an example of, uh, of, of, uh, an, uh, of, of an artistic work which contains the name of the donor inscribed at the base of uh, two statues. These two that you see on this slide are images of uh, two goddesses, Shakti Devi and Bhadrakali from Sursa 8th century CE, which was commissioned by Meru Varman. Um, and uh, these images are K Kashmirian images. They are particularly beautiful. Uh, they were commissioned uh, by the king uh, to be uh, made by a rather eminent artist of the region called Gugga, and we will come back to Gugga later. Shakti Devi's image on the far left is additionally inscribed with the message on the pedestal that she had conquered the king's enemies in fortresses. Now, these two images are from uh, the antiquities of the Chamba Valley by Vogel, and um, they are quite small uh, on this on this particular uh, representation uh, to show to reveal the the inscription at the base, but. I've given the bibliographical details of Vogel on the next slide and you can go have a look if you wish uh, at the source and um, have a closer look at the image. Now, one thing that is revealed uh, historically um, is that uh, the link between the goddess and, and, uh, and a king's royal assertion uh, is made manifest by the claim that the king has publicly uh, put down on this image that it is this goddess who had helped conquer the king's enemies. I am currently working on an article for the Brill Encyclopedia of Hinduism on Shakta inscriptions and I have also worked on Shakta inscriptions for my book, Heroic Shaktism. These are uh, some sources for the study of Shakta inscriptions. There are, of course, much more, and the list continues to grow. So for general uh, sources relating to the entire subcontinent, one may look at the Corpus Inscriptionum Indicarum, one may look at ep the Epigraphica, ep Epigraphia Indica, volumes 1 to 43. There are also specific uh, regional uh, uh, collections on North India, specifically the Himachal. One may look at the Antiquities of Chamba State, uh, which was uh, a work by Jean-Philippe Vogel. On South India, one may look uh, for short the inscriptions in the South Indian inscriptions, volumes 1 to 24. For Nepal and East India, one may look at the uh, Lichavi Kalaka Abhileka, uh, which is the, uh, a publication by Vajracharya. And one may also look for inscriptions of Bengal by the publication by Nonigopal Mojumdar, uh, inscriptions of uh, Bengal. There are, of course, a large number of other sources. These are simply a few to, uh, to, for those who had um, interest, uh, an initial interest. This slide shows inscriptional evidence of Shakta piety. Uh, it shows evidence of sponsorship issued to uh, Shaktism between the 4th and the 13th centuries in the form of copper plate or stone inscriptions and inscribed statuary. I've reproduced this from my book, Heroic Shaktism. Um, of course, this list is by no means um, exhaustive. It, 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 uh, it's still something that I'm uh, continuing to work on and it's still growing. 
uh, and you can come back to this at a later point and see the the inscriptions the the published sources uh, are uh, on the right the extreme right hand column next to that uh, the column shows the sites of patronage next to that the names of the donors and next to that uh, the the goddess receiving patronage and the extreme left uh, uh, column shows the era and date of the inscription. So the, while the first slide showed inscriptions between the 4th and the, the 9th century, this slide shows inscriptions between the 10th and the 13th centuries. And you will find that these uh, recorded acts of donation all uh, occur in a wide ranging area all over India uh, from uh, the south to the north from the east to the west. So what are the patterns that we can infer uh, from this inscriptional data? Let's look at that. Now firstly we can uh, plot uh, the rise of Shakta sites receiving patronage between the 4th and the 13th centuries uh, AD. So I've got two maps here. Um, one on the, the left uh, shows uh, goddess sites that received patronage between the 5th and the 13th centuries AD and on the right uh, are goddess maps that uh, goddess sites that received patronage between the 2nd and the 4th uh, centuries uh, AD so we see that um, the royal patronage of sites really grew uh, 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 between between the the the, the 5th and the 13th centuries AD. The map of this distribution demonstrates clearly that what were once obscure shrines to localized forms of uh, the, the, the goddess acquired patronage between the 6th and the 12th centuries in a remarkably broad area of the subcontinent covering one the Nagarjuni Hills, to Vasantgarh and Mewar in Rajputana, three, the Chamba Valley, Kumaun Hills and the Himachal, four, Kudarkot, five, Badami and Aihole, six, the Konkan Coast, seven, Orissa, eight, Mahabalipuram and Tanjore and other parts of the Chora and Pallava empires, nine, Pala Bengal, including Devi Kota, and ten, the Lichavi domain. The emergence of these shrines as officially patronized sites tells us that uh, within this later period, 5th to the 13th century, that there was a remarkable turn of fortune for Shaktism. It had grown to pan-Indic eminence as a result of robust patronage, despite all the stiff competition from other cults advancing merits to client rulers. We can also infer from the increased patronage to Shakti shrines that Shaktism as a whole had acquired the status of a great classical religion at a par with other medieval religions such as Vaishnavism and Shaivism. Its accessing patronage, a key process of prestigious kingship, meant that it had by this time developed tremendously in stature, for in the medieval period, the act of giving to a deity was no small matter casually undertaken, but formed the most meaningful way a king could tie himself to divine power. So strong did the belief in the cult's protective powers grow after the 6th century that even an influential Muslim settler on the Konkan coast in the 10th century is stated in an inscription dated 17th April uh, 926 
to have offered sizable land grants and gifts to a form of Durga called Dashami, a name referring to the 10th day of the Navaratra, in order to obtain her blessing in securing his political aggrandizement, while the great imperial city of Kanauj was host to not one, but, as we shall see, several Shakti-worshipping clans. Another uh, historical trend that we can infer from uh, the Shakta inscriptions is the assimilation of local goddesses with the mother and the warrior goddess Durga. An example for this is an inscription to, uh, to the goddess Vatayakshini Devi, uh, which is commissioned by Mahendra Pala uh, in his Patabgar inscription. This is Mahendra Pala, the Gujjara Pratihara king of Kanauj. And uh, in the Patabgar inscription, Mahendra Pala records issuing a village to uh, the local Vatayakshini shrine, which was in a Shaiva monastery of Harisheshwara. Um, what is interesting is that, uh, that, that in this inscription, what was uh, what must have been a local, uh, uh, small local goddess, is being eulogized with Durga. And it seems that an identification obtained between Vatayakshini and the Puranic war goddess, because in the initial part of the inscription, there is an elaborate invocation uh, in which Durga is described, and it seems that it is Vatayakshini who is indirectly referred to as Durga. Now, it is not unreasonable to make this assumption. Benedictions in early medieval inscriptions recording grants to deities often, though not always, praise the deities who are the recipients of the grants. Secondly, it was a common enough practice to identify otherwise obscure local goddesses with the more recognizable Durga in the invo invocatory preambles to early medieval inscriptions recording donations to their uh, sh uh, shrines. These invocations, transposing either Durga's triumphant foot surmounting Mahisha's head or her connection with Shiva, the lion and Skanda, um, or her suzerainty of the terrified gods to the goddesses of these small shrines tell us something important about how Shaktism became pan-Indic. By using concepts and terminology associated with the imperial Durga to describe a regional deity, they create a prestigious vocabulary whereby any goddess of territorial importance could be conceived and classicized. So, for example, in the Patapkar inscription, the benedictive verses echo a verse from the great poet Bana's hymn to Chandi's triumphant heroic form, the Chandi Shataka, which, given the prestige of its author and its appearance in at least three known uh, later medieval poetic anthologies widely used by students of poetry, was possibly already well known to the versifier. By evoking the poetry of Chandi, the poet succeeds in stamping Vatayakshini with all the hallmarks of the classical war goddess, although she may have been, as suggested by her name, a deity associated with the banyan tree. Indeed, it is in most of the benedictions to the inscriptions uh, or Shakta inscriptions from the medieval period that the universalized face of uh, Shaktism emerges, or the public face of uh, Shaktism emerges, and where one can see how a single concept was being uniformly applied to deities of independent sectarian affiliations to form a universal ideology. This particular invocation to Vatayakshini that evokes uh, Bana's Chandi Shataka, in fact, is a marvelous example of the the humor, the rhetoric, and the style of Shakta poetry. And 
we can find examples of this beautiful, uh, vivid poetry within inscriptional materials. And we can also see how the composers of, the, of, of inscriptional poetry were learned in uh, the, the classical literary, uh, uh, literary pr uh, predecessors. So in the case of the Vatayakshini uh, inscription, the benedictive verses uh, run thus, and you will see that there are some plus signs in the middle which indicate that those, uh, those particular uh, letters could not, were, uh, were not uh, interpreted, they couldn't be read. Um, so this is a verse in, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the Shardula Vrikrita uh, meter. Uh, Rudre vitravati drutam surapato pastyam prati prasthite vitte she prati panna rai shashanke sati vaikunthe mati kunthitam upagate brahmyam shrite brahmani payat vo mahisha suram suraripum devi drisha niknati I apologize for some typos in the, the verse. It should be Pratipanna Rai and it should also be Sura Ripum. Okay, now compare this particular verse with, uh, with Bana's Chandi Shataka verse 66. Note that the Chandi Shataka verse is in Sraghthara, but, uh, but note that even though it is metrically different, the overall thought and presentation corresponds very closely with the Vatayakshini invocation. Vidrani Rudra Vrinti Savitari Tarali Vajrini Dvasta Vajri Jata Shanki Shashanki Viramati Maruti Pyakta Vairi Kubiri Vaikunti Kunti Tastri Mahishamati Rusham Porusho Pagnanignam Nirvignam Vignati Shamaya to Duritam Bhuri Bhava Bhavani So uh, a translation, a provisional translation of the inscriptional verse, that's the verse beginning Rudre Vidravati, is thus. When in haste Rudra flies, Indra escapes to his stall, Kubera promises his wealth, the moon, and then we've got uh, the missing syllables. Vishnu grows, grows lost in his purpose and Brahma takes recourse to meditation. May Devi who slays simply with a glance, Mahisha, the foe of the gods, protect you. And then the uh, Chandi Shataka verse, Vidrani, Rudra, Vrinde, etc. When the Rudras ran, the sun god trembled. Indra's thunderbolt was destroyed. Affrighted grew the moon, slacked the wind. Kubera curbed his hostility, and Vaikuntha's weapons were blunted. She slew with ease the fiery buffalo dependent on manliness as a crutch. May bounteous power, Bhavani, end your sin. Another trend that uh, we find within the uh, Ishakta inscriptions is a confirmation of the rise of Shakta royal lineages. We have, of course, several lineages in this period who are Shaiva or Vaishnava in faith, uh, or predominantly Shaiva and predominantly Vaishnava in faith. But we also find uh, that there were a growing number of lineages who were primarily Shakta in, in their devotion. Now, amongst uh, several examples that I've 
discussed uh, in my book Heroic Sharktism, I'd like to point out here two examples. One was the the uh, the the lineage of the Gurjara Pratiharas of Kanauj, and in uh, several of their inscriptions, three kings, Nagabhatta the second, Poja the first, and Mahindrapala, are described as Param Bhagavati Bhakta, or supremely devoted uh, to the goddess. The second example is the Rajput lineage of the Chahamanas or the Chauhans of Sambar Lake. The inscriptions of this Rajput lineage evinces devotion to two goddesses. One is Shakambari, the goddess of the eponymous lake, which is modern-day Sambar Lake, and the other goddess, which is Ash, who is Ashapuri. One of their kings, Vigraha Raja II, Sursa from the 10th century AD, was a devotee of Ashapuri, as attested in an inscription of 973 CE. Inscriptions of Prithviraja Chauhan and Lakshmana Chauhan, the founder of the Naddula line of the Chahamanas, show that uh, they con conjoined their names with the goddess Shakambhari, including uh, Lakshmana's father, Vakpati Chahamana. So they styled themselves as Shakambhari Bhupati or Shakambhari Indra or Shakambhari Manikya. The inscriptions also show how um, temple complexes grew and how they developed. Inscriptions have, have shown us how Shaiva and Vaishnava temple co complexes have grown. But we also have uh, Shakta inscriptions that show the strengthening of temple complexes uh, devoted to a form of the goddess. The cult of the goddess Dashami provides a good example of a Shakta shrine that developed a firm and enduring tradition of accessing patronage from the powerful lineages of the surrounding region, in particular from the Rashtrakutas, whose imperialist ambitions over central India, it is tempting to think, may even have prompted their generosity to the war goddess. The shrine of the goddess was attached to a Vedika monastery, a Mathika, in Samyana, now Sanjan in Thane district in Maharashtra, which housed nine Brahmaras of the Pancha Gaudiya Mahaparshad, an association of North Indian Brahmins. Five donation plates concerning this shrine provide quite a detailed history. The first donor was the Rashtrakuta king Indra III of Marniaketa or Malkhed. On 17th April 926, a Muslim whose name is Sanskritized as Madhumati Sugatipa issued on behalf of the king the donation of a village called Karnaduka and land in another village called Devihara for repairing the monastery, the preservation of dharma and the feeding of the resident Brahmanas. Here again, we find the reasons for the devotion, uh, for the donation, clearly stated. However, the foundation of the monastery was not the work of a ruler, but of a group of ordinary, if clearly powerful, priests or scholars whose philanthropy was prompted out of a devotion to Durga. The application for founding the Matika was submitted by a Maitrayaniya Brahmana of the Bharadwaja line named Annaya or Annamaya. In an appeal for merit made by the founder at the end of the inscription, two other names appear, one Revana and one Kautuka, both of whom, along with Anaya, asked to dwell for a long time in the mountains of the gods through the grace of the goddess for whom they had exerted such effort and to whom they must therefore have been privately devoted. These individuals too seem to have been linked with Anaya with the establishment of the monastery and that such was truly the case is confirmed by another inscription where Kautuka is named as its founder. Subsequently, the Dashami Matika appears in an inscription from the Rashtrakuta Krishna III, 
939 to 967. By this time, the shrine and its monastery had developed into a large institution, for the inscription of the king paints a vivid picture of a bustling and prosperous establishment of learning and worship. The inscription says, and I translate, In this land there is a flawless and venerable monastery founded by Kautuka. It is appointed with rooms difficult to cross and freed of the taints of the age of Kali. It is filled with countless skilled students of the Veda who are sharp due to their intelligence, which has increased because they have understood the substance of all scriptures. Dexterous in all the dharmic aims, learned in the meaning of the Vedas. Pleasing because of people who have examined the arts and are pure, piled with excellent heaps of fine quality goods, it shines like the land of the gods with meritorious wise men in which the goddess Bhagavati, worshipped by gods and dhanavas, bestows boons to mankind like a wish-fulfilling tree. The monastery is adorned at its entrance with gates crowded with innumerable men busy in coming and going, their looming spires grazing the white clouds momentarily resembling crests and is appointed with many countless jewels that are none other than the flawless members of the association endowed with learning. On three further occasions, the shrine secured donations from local chieftains of Sanyana. In 1034, an oil press, so that it could become self-sufficient in producing its own fuel, required for burning a lamp before the goddess's image, and massaging the feet of the residents, granted by a subordinate of the Shilahara lineage named Chamunda Raja, in 1048 a tax in favour of some of the residents of the Matika granted by a Morha chieftain, Vidjala, and on 13th November 1053 a permanent endowment by the same patron. So, over the 127 years of the shrine's rise to prestige, it had become expedient for governors in the area to attach themselves to it through philanthropy. Not only was it a temple, but it was a complex institution housing scholars and supporting their upkeep. We also find the inscription in these inscriptions evidence of the establishment of a network through continued patronage to a specific sacred site by a donor. And this is uh, evinced by grants that were made to two goddesses of the Brihadishwara temple at Tanjor by a Chora princess, Arvar Parantakam Kundavayar, who was the sister of Raja Raja I. Now, even greater in terms of commitment and largesse, uh, greater than, say, the, the donors uh, to the uh, Dashami Matika, was the patronage network nexus that was established by this Chora princess, who is elder sister of Raja Raja Chora, 985 to 1014 AD. Arvar was also the queen of Vallavarayar Vandya Devar, so she was an eminent figure of the region and clearly very wealthy as the, the contents of her grants uh, make manifest. Arvar made donations of jewels and gold and much more to the goddesses of the Brihadishwara temple. In Tanjavur, the two Uma Parameshwaris, consorts of the Tanjai Vitankar and the Adavalla Dakshina Meru Vitankar. Over the course of four years, beginning from the 25th year to the 29th of Rajaraja's reign, and continuing into the rule of Rajendra Chola, 1012 to 1044, the princess made a number of by no means paltry endowments to the deities, which are meticulously catalogued in the form of three inscriptions occupying different surfaces of the temple walls. On the 310th day of the 25th year, she gave a number of gold vessels. 
From the 25th to the 29th years of Rajaraja's reign, she gave, excluding these vessels, 141 gold ornaments and emblems to one goddess and 35 to another, including a gold parrot and a swan, two handles for a yak tail whisk, two for a fly whisk and a crown. She also gave a large quantity of gold and jewels for decorating the sacred hall used for the chariot processions of the two goddesses. Besides the movable goods presented, the princess devised a method of financing the food, temple garlands, oil for the lamps and other expenses necessary for the goddesses' chariot processions and their festivals. She made several investments which were given on interest to villages which had to be paid annually to the temple either in cash or in the form of paddy. In the third year of Rajendra Chora, Kundavayar again made a substantial donation, this time a glittering hoard of 13 large and heavily jewelled gold ornaments. Now, Kundavayar's uh, in, uh, donations, uh, the inscriptions recording Kundavayar's uh, in, uh, donations are really invaluable for the details they give in uh, in in telling us how uh, permanent endowments were managed and organized. We know from these inscriptions that in South India, parts of donations were loaned to individuals in villages which were repaid with interest in kind. So one of the inscriptions recording the princess's uh, donation, this is in South Indian inscriptions 2.6, tells us, and this is an inscription on the south wall of the uh, second tier of the Tanjore temple, records um, a number of items gifted by, uh, by the princess. Now, as I'd mentioned, these gifts were made to the two Uma Parameshwaris, and it should be mentioned that these Uma Parameshwaris had been installed in the temple by um, the queen uh, herself, Another set of gifts were made to an image of her mother that she too had uh, installed. And another set of gifts were given to the deity Dakshina Meru Vitankar, which had been installed by her brother. Now, apart from these gifts and ornaments, the queen had endowed money to these deities for their sacred food, lamps and processions during holy festivals. As I had mentioned, these deposits uh, could be borrowed on interest by individuals of villages. And these villages belonged to uh, a Chandeshwara shrine. It seems that Chandeshwara was a saint in whose name financial dealings for temples were made. The interest was paid annually from the 29th year of the king's reign and it was made directly to the treasury of the temple in either paddy or money. Inscriptions also reveal that sometimes Shakta temples got into legal disputes. We know that uh, one of that the Dashami Matika that I had discussed uh, previously, that was exalted in such uh, uh, in such lofty terms by one of the uh, inscriptions, got into a bit of a spat with a neighbouring Pillamala Deva temple over land encroachment. Now, in one of the inscriptions, and this is an inscription from the Rashtrakuta King Krishna III, uh, uh, that, that this inscription records a legal resolution called a Vyavastha, issuing a punitive fine of 40 drammas and that too from a specific minting agency which the Dashami Matika was liable to pay every Deepavali to a neighbouring Bhillamala Deva temple for having taken over its, its land. So uh, even though uh, this Dashami Matika got into a legal scrap with its neighbour, it still uh, continued to secure uh, financial support as we saw that there were three subsequent uh, donations made. But nevertheless, 
this temple was obviously not without controversy and we learn about this controversy through the inscription. The scale of donorship to Shakta shrines was vast. Evidence suggests that it was not just members of ruling family or powerful people who supported Shaktism in this period. Significant individuals or associations of villages, particularly in the south, made grants which were as generous as royal donations and all inscribed on that very prestigious copper plate medium, which was mostly reserved for royal charters. A resident of Narur under the Choras made a donation that equaled in measure the grandeur of the Chora benefices, benefic beneficences made by the princess Arvar Barantakan Kundavayar, including a four-handed Durga on a jeweled pedestal enveloped by a solid aureole and ornaments of gold and pearl that included one gold and ruby marriage band set with five diamonds and one ruby. Similarly, in the Pandya domain, Nakkan Kori, a lady of whom we know little except that she was the wife of Shattan Ganapath, as evidenced in the inscription, commissioned two shrines, one to Durga, the second to Jeshta. On two occasions, powerful village corporations made donations to goddesses set up as protectresses of their villages on one occasion to Durga, also called Bhagavati in Aihol, on the other to Durga called Bhattaraki in Purrarur. We've already... Um, so we know that uh, Shaktism was richly supported by these private acts of patronage emanating from subjects and from the domain of local government, which demonstrates the wide devotional basis of the cult. In the previous slides, I had pointed out uh, social patterns that emerge from a study of the inscriptions. I now want to, want to point out aspects of <clears throat> ideas, beliefs, theology, worship, practice that, uh, that we can find out from inscriptional material. One aspect that, uh, that is evinced uh, by inscriptions is the practice of offering human heads to the goddess, especially as, as booty, as, as, uh, as, um, uh, as a form of a king asserting his victory over an enemy. And this is an inscription commissioned by Kumarapala, a Western Chaulukya, which begins with a rather fine uh, opening verse, uh, a beautiful, uh, a beautiful um, Shardula Vikrilita verse, which goes as follows. Arno Raja Narathi Raja Hidaye Kshiptvaika Bana Frajam Chyotal Lohita Tarpanada Madayat Chandim Bhujas Thayinim Dwara lambita mala vishvara shira padmena yashaharal Leela pankaja sangraha vyasininim Chaulukya rajanvaya. So the enemy here that Kumarapala defeats is Arnoraja, the king of the Malavas, and it seems that after defeating him, uh, Kumarapala cut off his head and then uh, put it up on his uh, on his uh, pal on his palace gate and offered the blood of Arnoraja's uh, decapitation to Chandi, the goddess. Um, so it says that. Chaulukya Rajanvaya, the scion of the, the Chaulukya lineage, Kshiptwa having cast Ekabana Vrajam, a, a single flight of arrows, Arno Raja Narathi Raja Hridaye, in the heart of the king Arno Raja, intoxicated Chandi, Amadaya Chandi. Bhujasthainim, who was present in his arm, Chyotad Lohita Tarpanad, through a propitiatory offering of 
gushing blood, the blood that was gushing forth from Arno Raja's uh, 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 wound. This skine of the Cholukyas, who, ya, arahat, cap, uh, aharat, captivated, Leela Pankaja Sangraha Vyasininim, the goddess who had uh, a penchant, uh, a, a, a habit for grasping, for holding Sangraha play lotuses with Dwara Lambita Malaveshvara Shirapadmena by the lotus like head of the Malava lord which he had hung from his from his gate. A further aspect of worship that comes across from the inscriptions is uh, the practice concerning the divinity of kings. These practices, when it comes to Shakta inscriptions, could very well have been tantric in, in, in quality. We know from an inscription that was commissioned by a Paramara king, Naravarman, that Naravarman had propitiated the tantric, uh, the tantric yogini goddess Charchika, and he boasts in that inscription to have received the ability to fly Kecharatvam, which is one of the sought-after uh, powers, occultic powers of Vidyadhara's uh, uh, wishes to gain from flying goddesses. So uh, it these these uh, inscriptions can also show how uh, how kingship modeled itself on images of sacred omnipotence. Shakta theological conceptions also emerge as an aspect of a doctrine within inscriptions. Durga herself uh, was connected to a variety of mythological traditions, but most particularly the Vaishnava and the, the Shaiva. She was known as both uh, uh, a goddess who was linked to Vishnu and as a goddess who was linked to Shiva, as well as a goddess who transcended all the gods. This becomes apparent by uh, an inscription again, which, uh, which contains a rather beautiful opening verse, uh, a, ben uh, a benedictive invocation. This is in the, in the, in the wonderful Sraghthara Mita. I will not sing this for, for brevity, uh, for, for constraints of time. I'll simply read the, the translation. She who is Yoga Nidra, the form of the creator that is the source of the universe asleep on the primordial ocean Vishnu, who adheres too to the half-body of the creator that dwells for good on the highest peak of Mount Kailasa. May that goddess Durga, who is Ratri in all the worlds, and Smriti among the wise, who is Shruti, the song of Brahma, bestow felicities to all beings in times of difficulty in this world. So within this inscription, two theological conceptions of the goddess are alluded to. One as Vishnu's sleep, uh, yogic sleep, yoga nidra. The second as uh, the, the consort of Shiva, the other half of Parvati. The goddess who is known as Ratri and who is also the embodiment of Vedic literature. Now, I've put at the bottom, uh, for those interested, uh, e uh, in a parallel to the opening verse of the Abhigyana Shakuntala, where again the eulogy to Shiva that uh, summons up the grandeur of the deity through the, this, this rather elegant um, uh, ya, ya relative clause construction, uh, is 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 used, you will see, in this particular verse, uh, uh, epigraphical uh, verse as well. Finally, I'd like to end with uh, an aspect uh, that is quite important that appears in, in, in uh, Shakta uh, inscriptions, which is the light uh, shed on the role and function of women in Shaktism. We know that women in Shakta traditions have a much more exalted and important role than in, in Brahmanical traditions. Uh, women uh, are considered to be vessels of Shakti, 
uh, and that uh, some women were considered uh, embodiments of the goddess herself is made manifest in a rather interesting inscription, the Sarahan Prashasti. This Prashasti was commissioned by a local chieftain called Satyaki who held power in the Himachal region. The Prashasti records the establishment of a temple to Shiva, but for much of this inscription, uh, it is Satyaki's wife Satya Prabha who is the chief object of praise. In fact, Shiva, who is the, the beneficiary of the donation, is evoked in, in a single st uh, stanza at, uh, at, towards the very end. Throughout the verse, uh, Satya Prabha is the main object of praise. Satya Prabha is in fact described through, uh, through, um, uh, through implicit allusions as the goddess Parvati. And the style of the verse is very much the style of uh, Kalidasa's verses uh, on Parvati's uh, body parts in the opening of the Kumara Sambhava. Um, so from 4 verses 4 to 21, Satya Prabha is eulogized in exactly the same manner as Parvati. And in the penultimate verse, verse 21, it is declared that Satyaki, the donor, had in fact established the temple to Shiva to immortalize the relationship, the Sakyam, between his wife and Parvati. On that note, I thank you very much and I, if you have any questions uh, on this lecture, please do refer them to the organizers of this conference and I would be happy to, to answer them. Thank you.